Just one second. Excellent. Um, I have my slideshow. I will share my screen and start right there. Thank you. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah. Anyone? We can see it. Perfect. Thank you. So um, I guess I'll just start with myself. My name is Damien. I work at FDM Toronto. Um, FDM is one of the biggest hires of recent graduates in computer programming, computer engineering, uh, computer science in UFT Toronto, UFT Ryerson, uh, and York University. Um, I myself graduated from Ryerson in 2017 from computer science. And FDM was one of the people that I found at a career fair, um, just in one of the booths. Uh, I interviewed for five places after I graduated, um, and I decided to go with FDM. They were my first job out of university, and I've been with them for uh, just about five years now, and I'm really happy with them. Um, so we can talk about, I'm not here to do marketing. I'm not in the sales department. I'm a trainer. Um, so I'm not here to recruit. If you're uh, interested to hear more about the company and what we do, uh, you're free to leave me a message. You're free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I will just leave my um, name and um, email in the chat if I can get back to it. So Damien Messick at fdmgroup.com is my email. And um, yeah, my in LinkedIn is my first name and my last name. Uh, my picture's a little out of date, but it, it still looks like me. Fantastic. So I'll start with the slideshow. Um, I'll share my code on GitHub. And then we'll dive right into the example in our lovely Windows XP virtual machine, which is going to be a lot of fun. OK, so homebrew development for Nintendo 64. Quite a fun topic, a favorite of mine. Nintendo 64 was released in 1996 and discontinued in 2011. It sold 33 million copies, so slightly less than its predecessor, the Super Nintendo and much less than its competitor, the PS1. It was the first Nintendo console to have native four player, the first one to have analog, and the first one to have fully 3D graphics. It had a very small library, relatively, of 388 games. Again, its predecessor had 17, 1,760, and its competitor, the PS1, had like eight times the games. So really small library on this system. It was my first system, uh, my first console. I have a lot of nostalgic memories with it and a lot of good games, I think. It's mostly written in C, notoriously difficult to program. Part of the reason why it had a relatively small library is because Nintendo had trouble getting third-party support. Its processor has a whopping 93.75 megahertz. Four gigabyte, four megabytes of RAM. Sorry, excuse me, not gigabytes. Four megabytes. So very weak by today's standards, but back in the day, it was its little powerhouse. So why am I doing a presentation on a system that is over twenty-five years old at this point? Obviously, um, it's difficult to program on N sixty-four with little reward. You're not exactly going to make some kind of product that's going to sell well in 2022. There's an extremely small player base of hardcore nerds who, who do this kind of stuff. But in my opinion, there are some transferable skills. I always thought that if you can code in C, then it's easy to move into Java. If, if you're coding in a difficult language, it's much easier to transition into an easy language. Whereas if you only know an easier language, it's harder to transition to a more difficult language. Some of the things we'll see in the demo will still exist in modern programming languages. Um, the core of any computer graphics is working with matrices. 
we'll see the projection matrix of the rotation matrix and the translation matrix. Those things are still integral to know for any serious animator. And we'll also see multi-threading, which is, um, in my opinion, a must know for, for, uh, for Java programming, for C programming. Okay, we'll take a brief look at the Nintendo 64 architecture. It's a power switch, the reset switch, the cartridge slot, of course, the expansion slot. It has one CPU, but then it also has the reality coprocessor, the RCP. So it actually has two different chips, um, which was kind of like one, one CPU and one GPU almost, but the RCP was for very specific tasks. And we'll see in the code, we won't dive too deeply into it, but when you're writing the code, you have to specifically mention which processor is working with which sections in memory. There's the digital analog converter. Um, I don't remember PIF, but four megabytes of RAM as well, which can be expanded to eight megabytes of RAM if you have the expansion pack, which I do. Like I said, the CPU and the RCP are two different processors. The CPU is in charge, but it delegates specific tasks to the RCP. Just like how with modern computing, the GPU is the graphic, the graphics card is very good at particular functions. We call it the reality coprocessor because it comes with two different sections. RSP is reality signal processor. RDP is reality display processor. And in the manual for programming Nintendo 64, um, you'll see the functions specifically call signal or display to do different things. We won't go into too much detail, but this is the basic idea. We have our model data, whether it's sound or graphics. We use microcode to translate it into a graphical binary interface command list. So it's a list of commands that are going to be done to modify um, whatever coordinates are in memory. That display list gets executed, first command, then the next command, then the next command by the RCP. And that gives us a frame buffer. So what does the current frame look like? What does the next frame look like? There's always two frames in the buffer, the current one and the next one. Then we have the digital media, digital media access controller, which will uh, convert the uh, digital data, that is the exact coordinates of everything in the frame buffer, and convert it to an analog signal, whether it's video or sound. And it converts that analog signal to send it to the TV. Nowadays, we don't convert to analog because everything Every TV takes a digital signal anyway. Okay, not too important to know every step along this way. Um, I guess the one part that I want to point out is part of the, the display list and the graphics microcode, this third step, part of that is the matrix manipulation that I mentioned. We're going to store all our coordinates in memory, and then we will do matrix multiplication to change those coordinates. So if, if my camera goes up, in reality, everything on the screen goes down. If my camera rotates clockwise, then really what's happening is every coordinate in the game world is rotating counterclockwise. So we're going to do matrix multiplication for rotation, for translation, for projection. Uh, we'll skip this. There is multi-threading in Nintendo 64. Uh, if you've never done multi-threading before, it's a really, really interesting topic. We're not going to go too much into depth today. I do have a separate workshop on multi-threading that I really like using Java. So maybe if I'm invited next year, we can learn that. Basically, we only have one thread on the CPU core. 
So if there's multiple processes going on, we have to switch from one thread by stopping it and then continuing another thread. This is very different from what programs look like nowadays. Um, most every modern CPU is dual core or quad core or eight cores or something like that. So I can have two threads running at the same time in a modern processor. But back in the day, my CPU can only handle one. So a thread would be like pausing the game. The game stops. It still has its own variables and such in memory. But now the menu, the pause menu, is in front of you while the rest is stopped. And if I kill the pause menu by going back to the game, this thread is deleted and the previous thread is restored. Threads send messages to enter different states, such as running, stopped, or blocked. And every thread has their own stack of memory. That's where you store the variables. Uh, to program this, we're using a Windows XP virtual machine. Um, I'm writing all of this. I'm writing command line uh, compile programs using GCC to compile the C code. There is a framework called a new system released in 1999, which makes N64 development a lot easier. It just bundles up a lot of initialization functions so that I don't have to constantly write, um, we call it boilerplate code. We're not going to be doing any kind of sophisticating, sophisticated modeling today. Um, we're just going to hard code our coordinates using numbers. So it's very, very primitive. Nintendo did not supply any proprietary 3D rendering software. Um, so it is possible to do Nintendo 64 uh, modeling with your favorite um, with your favorite 3D rendering program. Uh, it is even possible with Blender or Maya. Um, obviously, they're a little modern, so you probably have to back convert it. Um, but we can use Alias or Wavefront, our two uh, solutions that were popular in the year 2000. So before I go into the demo, I want to send you this GitHub repository. Hopefully it's public and I can send it with no problem. Can somebody click on that link and tell me if it's accessible? It's not. I'm no GitHub expert, I'll tell you that much. Try once more, and if it doesn't work, I'll save it for later. It works, fantastic. Thank you for the quick response. Sometimes, because I'm a trainer and I, I do lessons like this, and sometimes I ask a question and I just get a minute of silence. So I very much appreciate that. Okay, so there's the demo that we're about to do. I'm going to start from a very, very basic one and we're going to slowly build it up. So first, let me show you, uh, this is the sample program. Um, I sent, in the GitHub, I have a text file with a link to the development kit. Um, so if you follow that, I have a file called link to setup environment. That's just a URL. So from here, it lists everything that you need to download this. Um, 
I don't expect people to follow along with this workshop. That's not really the point. Otherwise, we would just spend an hour on setup. So um, I'll leave that to you if you wanted to get this and try it out on your own. Otherwise, you can just have fun watching me. And I'll go slowly so that I can try to explain everything. This is the basic starting point for our program. It's just a rotating square. I'm gonna do a couple of things. I'm gonna add controller support. Um, I'm gonna make it 3D so that it's not just a square. I'll make it a pyramid. I'll have the user be able to rotate it themselves. So I'll make it go clockwise or counterclockwise in the Z axis. And then uh, I want to implement a simple jump by pressing A. So the final version is going to look something like this. It is now a pyramid. I can rotate it. The projection isn't entirely correct. As you can see, some of the faces are bleeding into each other. I can press A to jump. And I can move left and right. Left, right, rotate, jump. Very, very simple. I wouldn't really call it a game. Okay, let's dive right into the code. Um, so some of these are compiled. Yeah, the ones that were made in 2022 are the compiled files. The ones that were made in 1999 are not compiled. This is the finished version. If I get stuck, I will move forward to that one uh, like a cooking show by showing you the, the finished product. Um, otherwise, there we go. Otherwise, we're looking at stage zero is the main one. We'll look at main C, we'll look at graphic C, I think are the main ones I need. So main, of course, the main class has this main proc, main procedure method. And this is where the program actually starts. Like I said, there is some boilerplate code new graphics in it, uh, initialize the controller, initialize new audio, initialize set audio. Um, in it stage zero, we're going to see this method. This is actually initializing game data. So for example, if I you know, set the 3D world around me at the beginning of the game, in it stage zero is actually going to contain that game world. And then I set the callback function, which is going to be stage zero. That just means that while this loop runs and it will run forever until the power is shut down, I will keep running stage zero to do an update. Stage zero down here says make DLLs, make DL00 and update game 00. We're going to look at that exact function now. This is in stage 00 and I have, like I said, make DL00 and update game 00. And sound check. So if I had a more complicated game, I would have a different file for every stage. So I'll just say the game processing for stage zero. And I'll say, this is the method for the function contains most of my game logic. Okay, um, the simplest place to start is, well, first let's turn off the rotation. Um, so I have this velocity thing. We're going to see where it is used in a second just going to set it to zero. Um, 
In order to compile it, I need to set up a couple of environment variables. So if you download this on your own, I'll basically need to run up this setup batch file every time. So cd c slash ultra setup dot bat. Okay, so it sets a bunch of environment variables. Now I can compile Nintendo 64 code in this um, CMD. Not this one, this one. Okay, now that I'm able to compile, I just want to see the simplest change possible, which was to turn off the rotation. So let's go here and I type make. Okay, I typed make and I can see 7.23 p.m. This was just recompiled. When I run it, it is no longer rotating. Okay, so that's compilation. Um, I typed make, I run the environment variables in my command prompt and I'm ready to go. So I want to actually take a look at where is this graphical data coming from? I have the square. I have green, red, blue, and black corners. Um, and I have to uh, fix these corners together to make them into a square. Let's take a look. I think the best way to start, the best place to start, is finding those vertices. So this is what we have here. Static vertex shade vertex equals an object, which is a list of objects, where each vertex takes a couple of parameters, x, y, z. And then I'm not sure what the middle three numbers are for. I think they're for projection. And then R, G, B, A. So these are graphical coordinates. Three, uh, three numbers for x, y, z location in space. Uh, I'll say coordinate, yeah. At four numbers for or for hexadecimal values, I should say. For color. And those values are RGBA. If you've never done RGBA before or RGB, these are the basics of storing a color as a value. So this has zero red FF means 16 times 16 is 256. So zero red, 256 green, zero blue, and fully trans, fully opaque, not transparent. The second one is RGBA. So the second one is black. The third one is, let's see, RG blue, and the fourth one is red. So green, black, blue, red is what we have here. Green, black, blue, red. Those are my four coordinates. Right, I didn't explain. Uh, the reason I'm using Windows XP is because Nintendo 64 is um, created in 1996. So uh, no way would it be feasible to use modern programming tools um, I mean, I guess I could write C in Visual Studio Code, but it's mostly for the compilation and the environment variables. Uh, these tools here would not be compatible in modern Windows. Are you using GL? No, but there are some similarities. Open Graphics Library will have um, if, so, if there's anyone that's very familiar with Open Graphics Library, you might recognize some of these functions, pipe sync, set render mode, um, something like GSP vertex, GSP two triangles. Um, all these functions are based off of OpenGL, but they're a pro pro proprietary Nintendo version. 
So it's, there's some similarities with OpenGL, but it's not, it's not exactly OpenGL. Uh, XP came out, I think, 2001. So um, I guess they would have coded in Windows 95 or, or Mac or Linux or something. Thanks for the questions. Keep them up. I'm enjoying it. I always, I always like the participation. Okay, so if these are my vertices, let's just make another small change and see those changes reflected. Uh, if I make all of these, if I add full red to all of these, first one's going to be red green, which is yellow. This one is just red. This one is red blue, which is purple. And the last one is just red. Save, make, and run it again. OK, yellow, red, purple, red, more like violet. OK, I don't want to just do a square. I want to make something 3D. So let's make our own vertices. So. Um, Vertex blue equals something, which will look like this. So let's say, we'll figure out the, the x, y, z in a second. But let's say zero red, zero green, zero blue, or sorry, entirely blue. have four of these blue, green, red, and yellow. So blue, R, G, B, green, red will be fully red, zero green, zero blue, and yellow will be fully red, fully green. Oh, sorry, I got that wrong. Fully red, fully green, zero blue. So these are my four vertices. Let me just align them. Very good. Okay. So how do I actually take these vertices and draw them? So first it was in an array called shade vertex. And the drawing was done in two steps. One is GSP vertex. The other is GSP two triangles. So the first function, I say this loads vertex data into the vertex buffer. So it says, where do I load it? I load it in the graphic list pointer and I increment the graphic list pointer. What am I loading? I'm loading this array of vertices. How many vertices am I loading for and in what location in the buffer? So starting from zero, I load four vertices. I'm going to change this a little bit for me. I'm going to say GSP vertex graphic list P plus uh, plus. Graphics list is defined at the top. It's just a list of all graphics commands. G list P equals GFX list GFX task number. Doesn't really mean anything to us. It's the display list buffer. I know that's not really an explanation. But basically, anytime I use any kind of graphical function, I need to send the pointer to this list as a parameter so that it's just a list of every single graphical command that's done. What am I what vertex am I loading? That is and blue. How many vertices? One. And in what location? Zero. Same thing for the other three. Blue, 
green, red, and yellow. I'm loading one vertex each, and I'm storing them in locations 0, 1, 2, 3. So I'm not directly, directly accessing the stack and saying, go to memory address this, but I'm saying go to the zero, to the first, to the second, the third address in the vertex buffer. This is going to make things a little bit easier because in the following functions, I no longer have to say blue, green, red, yellow. I can just say buffer zero, buffer one, buffer two, buffer three. Nice. Now that I have my four coordinates loaded, I'm going to say GSP two triangles. Actually, I don't think it's two triangles. I think it's just GSP triangle, but it doesn't matter. I'll do what's here. Again, graphic list pointer plus plus. And which triangles, which coordinates am I connecting to create a triangle? Well, let's think about this. I have coordinate one, I have coordinate two, I have coordinate three, and coordinate four. In order for me to draw a triangle, I need to say, go from zero, one, two, zero. Again. I want to make a triangle, I need to tell it what coordinates does my path take. So if I say zero, two, three, zero, that's another triangle. One, two, three, one, I just need to give it four coordinates. So make a triangle of zero, one, two, zero. Make a triangle of zero, one, three, zero. Make a triangle of zero, one. This should be the easy part. Um, zero, one, two, zero, zero, one, three, zero, zero, two, three, zero. And one, two, three, one. I think that's right. Okay, before I recompile these changes, I also want to change the X, Y, Z coordinates. So um, once again, top left was green. Um, and then it went to, and then it went, it went green, black, blue, red. That was the order. So it's going clockwise, meaning top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. So X, then Y, then Z, that makes sense. Okay, blue will be at the top. So this will be zero, 50, um, zero as well. Green will be at the left. So this will be negative uh, 40, Um, actually, sorry, negative 50, that means left, uh, negative 40 means vaguely down. Red will be the opposite of this. So on the right, still at the bottom and zero as well. And I want this to be a pyramid. So these three make up the triangle and yellow will be the point directly in the center. So zero, zero, and let's say negative 50. Okay, let's try this. It should look like a pyramid. GSP two triangles used with only five args. Maybe it was just GSP triangles with no. GSP triangle. Okay, 
that's no problem. I have the finished one down here. GSP one triangle, that's what it's called. Good. Try again. Okay, uh, it vaguely looks like a pyramid. I think the yellow is in the foreground or too far in the background rather, so I can't see it. Let's bring it forward. Yellow instead of negative 50. 50 means it points towards me. Okay, good. This is a pyramid, even though I can't see it very well right now. No questions, nice. Let me know if I'm going too fast or anything like that, or if you have any questions, go ahead and type them out. So we have a decent understanding of how the coordinates work and how I am mapping them. Naturally, no sane person writes out coordinates like this in, in real life. No sane person writes coordinates by hand. Instead, this would be generated by modeling software, such as Blender, with an R or with an ER. Great. Write the coordinates, load them into the buffer. Oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. This one, load them into the buffer. And then connect them via triangles. Okay, um, 20 minutes remaining. Let's go ahead and add some controller function. So when we started this originally, velocity was one and it was spinning. So where exactly is velocity used? Okay, here in make DL00, I'm running these functions. I don't know if this is the only place I run them. Yeah. GU ortho, GU rotate, GU translate. These are the basics of any 3D graphics animation the projection matrix, the modeling matrix, and the rotation matrix. And you can see that they all belong to this object called dynamic P. Dynamic P is designed, is defined as a dynamic, which is defined in graphic.h. So let me just show you what is a dynamic. It's a structure. So a dynamic takes a matrix projection, matrix modeling, matrix translation. And I've it's been a long time since I've done linear algebra. So there's probably, probably half of you in the chat are more familiar with this than I am. But basically, if I have a matrix that contains all my 3D coordinates, for example, this is a coordinate 1, 0, 1. Uh, I don't know, something like this. Then, okay, you've got all your coordinates about the game world. And in order to move them, I multiply them. Maybe this is, maybe this is like a two-dimensional, like a list of one-dimensional coordinates. So coordinate one, coordinate two, coordinate three. Maybe it's stored like that, I'm not exactly sure. But when I modify the coordinates in the 3D world, I would basically be, modify, be multiplying the matrix um, using matrix multiplication. 
So again, I don't remember matrix multiplication at all, but let's say this is like something like this. And this means to double the matrix. I'm, I, I've forgotten all of this, but for example, if I want to double this, then the final product would be something like this. So all the coordinates that were in the game world have now been doubled. Of course, double doesn't make sense. Um, no, no coordinates would actually do any kind of math like that. More realistically, if I'm rotating everything clockwise, then my multiplication is a lot more nuanced. So this coordinate goes up a lot. This coordinate goes up a little bit. This coordinate goes up very little. That one goes down. The next one goes down a lot. So not enough that I could actually predict this and draw it out by hand, but that's the basic idea. So I multiply it once for projection. And projection just says, if I'm looking at the 3D game world, I'm casting a line that goes forward and it hits the first object that it sees. That just means that I can't see anything behind that object. That's what projection is. It's which objects are the front most to the camera. Um, rotation means, of course, how are things rotating in the 3D game world? Translation, how are they moving left, right, up, down, forwards, or backwards? Why does it say projection modeling translate instead of projection rotation translate? I don't know. But this dynamic is going to hold these three matrices. And these three matrices will operate on every coordinate I have in memory. OK, so we're looking at lines 57 and 58. Rotate is saying everything is going to move by theta. Theta, 0, 0. So x rotation, y rotation, z rotation, forwards or backwards at what speed. Translation as well is done how much to the x, how much to the y, and how much to the z. OK, so I'm going to replace some of these with variables. Theta, instead of uh, x, y, z, a, it's going to be theta x and theta y. So theta x and theta y will be floats. Static float theta x static float theta y. And when the game starts, theta x equals 0, 0.0, theta y equals 0, 0.0. Okay, I'm just going to compile things to see that I haven't broken anything. This built in, this movement stuff. We're going to look at that to decipher um, controller input. Okay, so if theta x and theta a, x, and y are all zero, it's not rotating. So I want to change x to one or y to one or negative one depending on controller input. Before I do that, let's just see what happens. If theta is one, we compile and run. Okay, it rotates one frame when the game starts, but this is in the setup, not the, um, not the update. I want it to be in the update, not in init stage, but in make DL zero zero. So here, if I say theta a equals one point zero, let's try again. Oh, sorry, that's still the wrong function.
update game zero zero. Okay, never mind about that. Um, we know that theta will change um, as the game goes on. So I'll, I'll find a place for that, don't worry. Okay, so controller is this object cont data at zero. It's an array because uh, there can be up to four controllers in a Nintendo. Zero, one, two, and three. So I want to say something like um, if cont data at zero dot button and um, I don't know if you know what the controller looks like. It's got some yellow buttons on the right. Uh, so these yellow buttons are C left, C down, C up, and C right. So I think it's something like C or U, C button, something like that. Let me double check. R underscore C buttons with an S. So I'm going to say left C button. We'll say theta x plus equals 1.0. And if it's the right C button, theta x minus 1.0. So while I am holding those buttons down, the theta will go up by, by up or down by one. Compiled 749. So the changes are there. But they're not registering them. Let me double check. Right. I have to specify the theta, but I also have to specify the uh, the last value in the rotation. So right now it's theta x, theta a, theta x, theta y, and one. Which means if I want to rotate, this one has to go up, but these two have to stay the same. And the last parameter has to be one as well. So what I actually want is uh, I don't have a theta z in mind, that's fine. But uh, y has to be one and A will go up or down. Let me just double check that. Okay, uh, it's rotating in two dimensions, which isn't exactly what I want. But you get the gist of it. Theta Y is one, theta A. Hmm. I'm not going to waste your time. I just want to see this one, if this one change fixes it. Oh, that was the wrong one. Okay, so it is rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. So that's one dimension. If I add C up and C down, can I do it in another direction? So if I do up C button and down C button, now I want to say that X goes up 
and a goes to zero. And here, x goes down, and a goes to zero. And I'll double check the exact parameters in just a second. Okay, now I got nothing from, from up and down. Again, looking at the GU rotate function, I'm saying x, or sorry, a, x, y, and then always one to mean, to mean it's going forward. Um, so I define an angle in three dimensions, and then I define the speed or the, the direction for the fourth, fourth argument. Okay, so we got the basic rotation. I'm happy with that. Um, we have about five minutes remaining. I want to try to do a jump as well. So if um, I've got these triangle position um, variables, I've got tripos x, tripos y, and I want to say that y can, is always falling but never goes below zero. Let me try that. Always falling, but never below zero. So in update game, I want to say, the pyramid is always falling, but never below zero. So we'll do this one step at a time. We'll say, uh, try pause. Try pause y. Uh, minus equals one, just to start with. It starts at negative one, but it's not falling lower and lower. Minus equals one. And this is in update game. So this should be getting called every time, unless it's resetting at the beginning of the function. It only initializes the one time. So that is strange. What if I put it at the top? Comment. Workshop will end in five minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, that's all right. We have um, just enough time to look at the finished code, which is um, it will call jump every time the game is updated, and jump will just says will just say um, the velocity is zero, jumped is false. Uh, sorry, if I have fallen too low, I have touched the ground. So when I touch the ground, my velocity is zero. My position is zero, and my jumped is zero, which means I am fault, which means it is not in the air at the moment. If I press A, then jumped equals true, and velocity goes up by 10. So my velocity is 10, and then every second it goes down by one. So my velocity is 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Once it reaches zero, it stops rising. Then my velocity becomes negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. And all the while, the position is changing relative to the velocity. 
So let's briefly take a look at the final version, which is the one that's on GitHub. So I press A. And notice that I can't double jump because I have this jumped equals zero. So I can only jump once and I can only jump when I'm on the ground. Take a look at that jump logic on the left and let me know if it doesn't make sense. Great, so that is about as much as I wanted to accomplish within the hour. I hope you had fun. I know it's not a lot. Uh, this is the finished product. It's just a little pyramid that jumps around, it can move. But um, you know what? That's more than I've gotten in the first hour of some programming languages. So I'm pretty happy with this. And if you're curious, if you put this on a memory card onto a flash drive, this can actually run on the original hardware as well, which is very exciting. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Awesome. Thank you so much, Damien, for doing this presentation. Hope you had fun. You can drop me any questions via email. Um, if you'd like a job, if you're close to graduating, FDM hires year-round. Um, we hire from all kinds of different backgrounds. It doesn't have to be computer programming. We hire physics majors, music majors, you name it. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me.